Would you? Welcome to the Center of Human Rights Research at the Forks launch. My name is Kayla LaRiviere. I'm the Indigenous intern at the Center this summer. I would like to acknowledge that I'm coming to you virtually today from Treaty 1 territory, the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Diné peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We at the CHRR are excited to have you all join us today virtually as we will be unveiling our new online platform. If you have any questions during the launch, please feel free to add them in the chat or direct message me here on Zoom and I'll be sure to come back to it at the end during our Q&A session. I also ask that you please mute yourself and you can also turn off your camera if you choose. I'm going to begin by introducing Dr. Adele Perry. Dr. Perry is the director of the Center for Human Rights Research. She's a non-Indigenous historian who was brought and raised in British Columbia and has taught at the University of Manitoba since 2000. Perry has worked on histories of colonialism in the 19th and 20th century Western Canada and is committed to making connections between the past and present. I will now pass it along to Dr. Perry. Um, thank you to Kayla uh, for that um, introduction and thank you to everybody who's uh, made time in um, a busy summer Friday to, to join us digitally as we kind of launch this particular venture. Um, so those of you who follow um, the center's um, social media, and if you don't, you could always start now, um, know probably already what remarkable work Kayla has done over um, the course of the summer where she's really kind of brought our um, social media work to kind of um, a new level and lots of interesting material. And um, this is just kind of a, a glimmer of, of some of the, the really important work she, she has done. So thank you very much um, to Kayla. So we're, we're launching a new venture and this is uh, something that is um, a moment of, of celebration, but it's a moment that occurs um, in a wider context of great um, sadness and reflection. And I think great tenderness as we grapple with the implications of the confirmation of longstanding um, community um, knowledge regarding the deaths of children and the way those deaths were handled at Indian residential schools across Canada. And so I, I want to begin by, by noting that. Um, and I'm also just going to ask if somebody can make sure that I have screen sharing here. Um, I just want to share a couple of slides um that sort of speak to that particular context that we are all um, in varying ways and to varying degrees grappling with so i'm just hoping that somebody can um, empower me to share screen i seem to have uh, my screen sharing disabled so is there Kayla, can you, thank you. We're working on that. We'll get that sorted for you in just a sec. Oh, great. So I want just to um, draw your attention um, to a couple of, of things. The first is, um, a list of resources that have been compiled by our colleagues at the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. And this includes the National Residential School Crisis Line, and then also um, phone numbers and resources for different provinces. And these are resources that are designed for um, residential school survivors, um, including intergenerational survivors. I also want to um, draw the attention your attention, particularly if you are um, like me, descendant of settlers and are um, from settler communities and histories, I would encourage you to take this as a moment to um, listen, to learn, to reflect. Um, our colleagues at the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation have compiled remarkable um, and wide ranging resources on their website and it is linked to there. And for those of us who have resources, I would also encourage you to um, think about where those might be directed. And one of those places includes the Indian Residential School Survivors Society, 
and I've linked um, to that there as well. And I'll make both of these links um, available in, in the chat as we go on. So what um, we are doing here today, um, in a sense, reminds us of the importance of putting these kinds of histories and conversations about them in a public context and in a sensitive and, and rigorous way. It is a difficult time, but also one that makes clear the necessity of centering and exploring Indigenous histories and colonial histories in and around the places um, where we live. And hopefully that is something that this new digital platform that we are launching will do. Um, at the Forks is a joint project of the Center for Human Rights Research and Mama Whippowin. The Center for Human Rights Research was founded in 2012 by um, founding director Karen Busby with the aim of working to develop research capacity, create opportunities for students and training at the university and in the wider community. Over the years, the CHRR um, has undertaken and fostered research on a range of topics, including museums and commemoration, children's rights, reproductive rights, and more. Indigenous rights, um, especially around water, but also in a range of other contexts, have also always been a central concern. So I became director of the CHRR almost a year ago. It's almost my one year birthday as CHRR director. Um, and that was a moment that at the time didn't seem like it was early in the pandemic. It seemed like it was quite a long way into the pandemic. But of course now in reflection, that seems like such early days to what has emerged as a punishing um, and ongoing global pandemic. Um, but in that context, two immediate things on my agenda was to build the CHRR's longstanding engagements um, and the connections between Indigenous and human rights, and also to move online. At the At the Forks platform aims to do both of those things. It takes its name from the place where we are, are located in. I'm currently on my porch, not very far away from the Assiniboine River and more particularly from the meetings of the Red and the Assiniboine Rivers in present day Winnipeg, Manitoba. Um, this place is called Nistataiwak or Three Points in Cree, and it is the site of ancient and ongoing histories. As a platform at the Forks aims to support and disseminate work um, that engages this particular place within its wider context, namely present day Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and stretching into our neighbors in Northwestern Ontario and south of the Medicine Line. The name at the Forks also gestures to the way that we hope to bring Indigenous and human rights ways of thinking and acting into conversation. Um, the goal here is not to um, suggest that the two frameworks are one or are interchangeable for one another or without tension. Um, rather, it's to kind of provide a space to explore the ways that we might help us understand, that both of these ways might help us understand our past and our present. We are interested in work and hope you might consider um, submitting some of that work that engages these places through the lenses of human and Indigenous rights and are committed to seeing the way that these historical processes and resistance to them have taken gendered forms and have meant different things for different indigenous peoples and also for different migrants, settlers and newcomers. Um, indigenous histories are far from seamless and not all settlers have been equally welcome and centered here. Our goal is um, to publish articles that run between about a thousand and five thousand words in kind of a strong visual context and we'll get back to that um, in a little bit later. We're aiming in a sense for pieces that are shorter than a standard academic essay or chapter or government report, but more substantial than um, your usual opinion piece, which generally runs about 600 to 750 words and definitely have more substance than a tweet. We're hoping to publish material written by community-based authors, by um, senior undergraduate and graduate students, by both emergent and established scholars, we're interested in prioritizing Indigenous scholarship and art, and also to really disseminating and connecting the important and ongoing work that is being done by researchers um, in the context where we are located in the city of Winnipeg and also beyond it on questions of our Indigenous and colonial past and present. 
we're hoping that this kind of work can be easily and successfully integrated into classroom teaching, uh, particularly as it remains um, to greater or lesser extent online um, and can be used at both sort of a secondary and post-secondary level. You know, it's probably fairly clear at this point, or it certainly should be, that this has been from the outset a group project with lots of different moving parts and lots of people making a lot of really important contributions. And I will then turn things over now to a couple of those people. And first of them is um, collaborator and partner in this project, Kiera Ladner. Thank you, Adele. It is uh, awesome to be here and to be launching this today. Um, I just want to begin by uh, saying a few words about the the other co-host of this. It's it's hosted at uh, CAHR. But it's also a collaboration between CHR and Mama Weepwin. And Mama Weepwin was launched in 2011 with funds from CFI, uh, really to support my research chair at the time. It has evolved into uh, really to try and support uh, research and governance and community based research projects, Indigenous uh, led projects, uh, as well as allied led projects. Uh, we have uh, a number of projects ongoing right now, including uh, a number of digital archive or digital um, uh, database, digital bundle projects, all have a different name. We have one being led by Dr. Shauna Ferris over in Women and Gender Studies, uh, which is working with sex work activist organizations and, and doing some archives with them. Uh, we, Sean and I both work with Walking With Our Sisters or what remains from Walking With Our Sisters. Adele Perry helped out with this project, recreating Walking With Our Sisters into a digital bundle so that Walking With Our Sisters can continue to be an honoring and a commemoration of the missing and murdered women. Uh, we also have a big project on COVID, uh, working with the COVID Social Impact Network or the COVID Impact Network uh, co-hosting this, uh, looking at COVID's impacts on uh, newcomers and Indigenous people in Canada, the US and Mexico with Lori Wilkinson and Association of Canadian Studies. We are so happy to join Adele. I jumped at the chance to do this with Adele uh, despite busy schedules and everything else. Uh, I think it is just such a great opportunity to start to think about uh, different ways of mobilizing knowledge and really what do we do with so much of the research that is done by students and graduate students that is so phenomenal that seldom sees the light of days outside the university walls or outside of uh, the inbox of uh, papers that we mark. I want to take this time to thank the funders, which are CHR, CHRR, pardon me, um, Women and Gender Studies through the Margaret Lawrence Foundation, History Department, Faculty of Arts, Momo Wipwin, and Shirk. And I also really want to take the time to thank the students that have worked on this project. We have uh, an, uh, Kayla and, and Amy with us today and others, Helen Falding, the former uh, director or former executive director of the center, uh, Pauline Tennant, who is now in the role of manager, and Kirsten Quaring. And I know I've probably left some off and my apologies for that. As Adele was saying that we are looking to publish work at the intersection of human rights and in Indigenous rights and Indigenous histories. Uh, we do not look at those as uh, necessarily inclusive or necessarily the same. We really want to tweak out and, and search out and really investigate that intersection. We 
we're hoping that when we launch today, and I have to, I'll be the one that says this, uh, we were hoping that when we launch today that we would have a number of articles posted. We have an article that is up from Adele, um, and one was supposed to be up from me dealing with treaties and COVID, but that is going to have to wait a week or so. Uh, but to give you a taste of, of the type of articles that we're doing, we both agreed to try and uh, be the initial populators with the hope that we will have some submissions coming in shortly. And I know that we have a couple in, at least in hopes. Uh, the work that I'm going to do on treaties is really a very short, pithy piece on focusing on vaccination politics. And I really uh, want to highlight that it's a vaccination politics from a treaty perspective, as well as a looking at uh, a treaty based response to COVID and to government inaction. I'm writing this with a former MA student, Megan Clochier, uh, and we are uh, working from some of the work that she did for a paper this past year at the University of Calgary during her PhD. This work begins at the Forks. It begins here in Manitoba, although we are taking a prairie stance for this work. This work begins in Manitoba with a comment by Premier Pallister complaining on December 3rd that if First Nations were to receive preferential treatment in the uh, getting vaccines, that Manitobans would be at the back of the line. And this was the case, and he reiterated several times that day, that Manitobans would be at the back, back of the line for vaccines because Ottawa was prioritizing uh, First Nations or Indigenous people for vaccines. He complained and complained. And what's interesting is his complaint was really about that there were priority groups that would not get their vaccine in a timely manner and that other Manitobans would not get their vaccine in a timely manner. Those that needed it. I find these comments problematic for so many reasons. And I'm sure that Everyone here holds that same view. They are problematic for so many reasons, both historical and current. What's interesting is that, well, he went on to talk about Indigenous people wrongly being at the front of the line for vaccines. What the reality is, is that Indigenous people have been at the front of the line for COVID. They've been at the front of the line the whole pandemic at the front of the line facing largest social economic impacts at the front of the line for infections by COVID at the front of the line for ICU beds. Currently 42% of ICU beds in the province are First Nations people. This does not include non-status, Métis or Inuit, only registered as Indians under the Indian Act. 70% of all cases in the province to date have been First Nations people. And of course, only 10% of Manitoba's population is First Nations. It is a different line for First Nations people. And it is a line which should also be acknowledged as a treaty line. And that the response to COVID by the governments, it has been in part by the federal government, they've at least talked and acknowledged treaty, but the response by government should be defined by treaty. And this is what we're going to look at in this paper. That while the front of the line for reasons of disease should also be the front of the line because of treaty. It is a different line. It's a treaty promises, 1873 here in Manitoba, 1871, pardon me, treaty one right at the forks. There were outside promises that were made to healthcare, arguably. 
although in 1899 or 1889 a separate agreement was signed acknowledging that th these outside promises were dealt with and that health care was not one. Regardless as to whether health care was in fact a promise in, in Treaty 1, the Queen's benevolence was a promise in Treaty 1. Other treaties, we know Treaty Number 6 includes three promises that should be looked at in terms of COVID response. There's the my favorite clause in the treaty, assistance during times of starvation and benevolent or starvation and pestilence. And if this isn't a time of pestilence and starvation, like smallpox, which was being which was the basis of this request, I don't know what is. Pestilence and starvation, a health, uh, a medicine chest was supposed to be on all reserves, and general benevolence of the Queen was promised in all of the prior treaties. These treaty promises really give reason to start to discuss what the response was and what the response should have been by both provincial and federal governments. When the federal government pushed aside vaccines for First Nations. This wasn't an act of benevolence outside of their obligations. This was living up to obligations. And we need to talk about this. And so this is what the essay will do. We'll also talk about other issues of treaty. And those are, of course, we need to look at how the treaty nations have stepped out of the Indian Act during this pandemic, or as I would say, a syndemic, to exercise the rights of sovereignty that were protected or were supposed to be protected by the treaty. And so this essay will, of course, go further and will engage in issues of treaty federalism or treaty constitutionalism, and we'll look at that pandemic through that lens. So this is the type of research, not necessarily that which we would necessarily always have seen as human rights research, but really pushing that boundary to look at that intersection between Indigenous rights and human rights. Please pay attention to our broadcast for submissions. We really do look forward to seeing submissions from senior scholars, junior scholars, students, and the community. And we hope that this is a, a portal that will be able to not only be used in our classrooms or in student research, but we also hope that this will be there for community research and for communities that are community members that are really trying to engage and look outside for some materials. I want to just introduce our next speaker, Amy Jackson, one of our phenomenal students that are working on this project. Amy is from a Basque Cree Nation. She is doing her MA in uh, Native Studies here at the University of Manitoba. She's working both for the CHRR for the summer, as well as Mama Weepwan on separate projects. She's a just a fantastic powerhouse of a student and a powerhouse of a young researcher who is doing her MA on File Hills back in Saskatchewan. So welcome, Amy, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Dancy, everyone. Um, I just wanted to take a few minutes to actually go through and show you the website. Um, uh, with huge thanks, of course, to uh, um, Dr. Adele Perry and Dr. Kira Ladner for um, creative freedom and putting together these designs. I um, was very excited and very inspired, of course, by Prairie History. I think that, um, well, in Winnipeg, we're, uh, we're at the heart <laughs> of, our, of our country, of our nation. And um, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of um, <clears throat> incredible stories coming out of the prairies and I was really inspired by that and so that is where a lot of my imagery comes from so I'm going to share my screen here and so this is um, 
the banner that I designed with a photo of um, Fort Gary, an image of Fort Gary that was um, uh, designed or sorry, um, drawn, I guess, uh, in or painted in 1871 and uh, printed in the Toronto News. Um, very, very cool piece, um, but it shows, uh, you know, um, it's like a, a piece that is like history in action where you see um, uh, settlers and, and Indigenous people uh, together in one piece, which I thought was very fitting. Um, so when we scroll down here, we have a couple of buttons here that take you to the pages with the content. Um, so I went with like the gold, uh, yeah, the golden yellows and the greens and the browns and some black with the, the imagery. And yeah, if you scroll down, here we go. Here is um, Dr. Adele Perry's um, introduction to the page that we have uh, the blog on. Um, so the major, or sorry, the latest posts that come through the website will be featured right here in this area. Um, and of course, if you just click here, it takes you directly to the post that uh, it intros. So this is um, the original uh, at the Forks post that explains a little bit about the website and the vision. And of course, um, uh, a work, a piece by uh, Dr. Adele Perry. Then I, at the bottom, I have these larger buttons that take you directly to, um, that are navigational. So you take you to different uh, areas of the website. So here you will find the latest posts that we have. Um, here we will have a list of contributors with their bios and photos. Um, here the archives will be um, uh, any articles that are, are not in the latest, so anything in the past. So. Um, and then the staff will be uh, under the staff button, of course, will be um, some photos and some bios and information about the people who are behind this website. Uh, credits, I will put uh, photo credits where I got photos from um, artists who contributed their photos to the certain uh, blogs um, uh, and, and things like that. So, that is where I will enter all of the credits. Of course, if you notice on the bottom hand corner of these images, there is a credit there, but I also wanna give full credit where you can find this information, where you can find the artist or et cetera. That will be under credits. Again, there's another archive button. So like if you are searching for a particular um, article, you can find it here. And then I put a page for the funding. So, so to acknowledge um, the partners, that um, have put at the forks together. So yeah, so there's a little walkthrough of the website. Um, yeah, it's pretty uh, straightforward and I hope you uh, enjoy it. <laughs> oh, and I guess I should hand it off. <laughs> um, yes. So I believe I hand it right back to uh, Kayla. Thank you for that, Amy. So we're going to do a little Q&A session now. So if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, the first one I will ask and direct it to either Dr. Perry or Dr. Ladner, whoever wants to take this one. Um, so the first one is, how do we submit an article and is there a deadline? Ooh. So I'll, I'll take that one. Um, yeah, how do you submit an article? You can send us an email. So you can send an email to me at adele.perry at umanitoba.ca. Um, I think if you also send it to chrrman at umanitoba.ca, it will also get through to the right people. Um, we're looking at this as an ongoing project. So we're hoping to have um, regular um, content sort of featured. So there is no um, fixed deadline. We're looking at something that hopefully we'll post things um, a couple of times a month. Um, and we're also looking at kind of building something that, that kind of has some sort of organic capacity to change as people's needs and the kind of work um, they are doing does. So 
um, you're certainly welcome to, to sort of be in touch and to um, ask further questions um, as well. I think that the other great thing is that we have the we have the um, opportunity with this to also offer some honorariums to uh, writers um, on this, and I think that that's just a fantastic um, thing that we can do with this, especially for the students. And we will also be including and, and trying to reach out to Indigenous artists and including Indigenous art and uh, trying to match and, and make this as visually appear uh, as visually appealing as this website that's been designed and it is apps I'm reading all the comments as they come up and it is absolutely beautiful Amy thank you for that so um, I'll return this to the floor if there's any other questions Uh, there's one more question here. So it is, what is the timeline from a piece being submitted to it being up on the website? Oh, excellent um, question there. So many of you who are um, familiar with academic publishing knows that probably know that it can often be pretty slow. And one of the virtues of a platform like this is that we can hopefully be a little faster. So it will probably depend on what we have already scheduled, um, but I think um, certainly in the early days, which we are now sort of beginning, we could look at things um, probably going from submission to going live within um, somewhere between a couple of weeks to a month. Um, so we're not going to have a formal peer review process. We're going to have more of an editorial process, and this will involve um, graduate students and some of the other students who are involved in this project um, as sort of a, a really interesting and kind of generative process of working with submissions and um, working with um, people who would like to contribute. So everything will be read by at least two people um, and we will work with it, but we don't foresee that being um, a particularly slow process. Um, I'll also say for people who are involved in other kind of web-based platforms, we're also really interested in um, cross-posting and in featuring work that is done in collaboration with other um, kind of similar things with, with kind of roughly um, compatible aims. Thank you. Uh, I got a couple more questions in. So one of them is, do you have any suggestions for components that you would like to see in the pieces that would make them more interactive? If you know of artwork or digital media that would be really visually appearing, ap appealing or would make them more interactive, um, if you know or have ideas for that, submit it with your articles or urge others to submit them with their art of their articles. Um, I think that this this gives us a platform to try new things. So if you have ideas to try really different or innovative things in knowledge mobilization, I think that both Adele and I are really into trying these things. I know that uh, well, when we put that's what we that's what we try to do. As a result, we're stuck on a on a couple big things of uh, uh, archive development that takes four years longer, five years longer, because we're developing our own software. Because the software doesn't work for us, so I think that that is the type of innovation that I know I'm interested in. So if there's ideas, I mean, so I think that we would we would very much like to try to do. Um, what is really innovative and, and, and to try and just break those boundaries between the academy and community uh, in different ways as well. So, Adele, any other ideas on that? Yeah, I'll just ditto all of that. Um, I think we have some ideas of sort of artwork and archival pieces that, that we will use. I think this is the kind of project that needs to be strong visually. And I think, you know, Amy has done such amazing work to kind of make that uh, possible. 
Um, but absolutely, we're open to different ideas and different possibilities. Um, and we're open to just also just sort of talking about about things. But certainly, if you're thinking about pieces of writing, if you have images, um, if you have artists that you can um, suggest and we can kind of connect with, I think the more ways that we can kind of build connection and also think about new ways of, of working and disseminating knowledge, um, that is something we are ready for. Thank you for answering those questions. I have a couple more that came in. One of them is, is there a criteria or requirement for the eligibility of applicants? You know, not that I can think of in any um, particular sort of clear way in the sense that we're looking for people that are writing about these questions. I think we are all committed to um, centering Indigenous scholarship and, and perspectives and art and cultural production. Um, but I think we are also um, interested in the range of ways that people coming from a number of different kind of locations broadly defined engage these questions. So um, I don't think we're in, there is um, any particular kind of criteria. I think one thing that makes this interesting is is also using this as a, a venue that to launch new ideas and, 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 and new research that when you're playing around i know that we're uh, have a project on missing and murdered women and we've we've been working with walking with our sisters and as we're playing around with how to uh, launch this and and reach different audiences uh, I think that this is a great platform that can that can possibly do that, rather than to just go to some dry academic journal. I think that we, as academics, we need to do both. And I think that this would be a place to launch something that's visual, like walking with our sisters. So, um, I don't think that we we have an absolute idea as to what we have in mind. We have, I think that. COVID has shown us that, you know, the world is, is, is open and open to anything. Thank you. I'll move on to the next one. Um, it is, the website is appropriately focused on Indigenous peoples in the Prairie Provinces. Are you interested in transnational pieces or pieces that engage with the global definitions of Indigenous identity? Um, she was thinking of the UN and how other Indigenous communities in other settler societies are engaging with potentially similar or dissimilar human rights issues. So thank you uh, for that question um, that comes from Carla um, Joubert. Um, we are absolutely interested in maintaining kind of both a focus on this particular context we're working in, but understanding that these particular places only make sense within the wider context and amid wider connections. And I think in different ways, both Kier and I are um, committed to kind of transnational and um, interconnected sort of scholarship. And so I think one of the things, and I should explain a little bit of this in, in the essay that is live already, is that we're interested in seeing is things that, that do draw those connections. So we are absolutely interested in work that kind of walks that line between being rooted in the local and knowing that the local only makes sense in a global um, trans-imperial um, interconnected indigenous world. And so I think that's something that we would also like to sort of see um, this as a project to be able to um, feature. Great, and uh, one more here. It is, would poetry or short stories that are grounded in research be an appropriate submission? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. Um, and I don't know if that's something that we have entirely sort of um, had um, a huge amount of thought given to, but I think we're certainly open to um, the idea and to talking about what that kind of might look like. And I think, you know, there are a lot of um, 
writers and researchers and people whose work kind of bridge those two uh, kind of aspects of kind of production um, in and around the communities that we're engaged with. And that's something that we could certainly um, look to um, thinking about. I think we have on the call um, Jocelyn Thorpe and I'll just give a bit of a, a shout out to Jocelyn who works with the center in a couple of ways, but is also I think I'm allowed to say the new incoming director of um, the Center for Creative Writing and Oral Culture. Yes, there's Jocelyn saying hi. Um, and so one of the things that, that as we kind of move forward and, and um, work on these projects that we're thinking about doing is also some of the ways that we can kind of build those connections. And so the, the kind of work that you're raising there might be something that, that could fit within that sort of connection, for sure. All right, I do not see any more questions coming in. So with that, I want to say thank you to everyone who took the time out of their Friday to join us and spend your day with us. If you have any more questions that come up later, you can feel free to email um, a Dr. Perry or Dr. Ladner or the center, and we will get back to you as soon as possible. So thank you so much, Chi McWitch, and I hope you all have a great day.